Hello, and welcome to Lecture 1 of the Energy Unit in Phys 1104. And we're going to start off by continuing our look at collisions. We're going to stick with colliding carts for a while yet. It's a very clean sort of situation where we have a lot of control over what's going on. And at this point we've seen two quite distinct situations. One where the carts come together and bounce off of each other. We usually do that with repulsive magnets on the carts and another, which we usually do with Velcro, where they stick together. And something to notice is that momentum is conserved in both of those, as long as friction is negligible. But there's clearly something different going on in these situations. It's just that momentum doesn't tell us anything about this difference. So we need some other physical quantity that's going to allow us to distinguish between these situations. Well, this is actually sort of similar to bouncing a ball. So let's think about bouncing a ball. You could have a very bouncy ball, like a super ball, which, if you drop it, bounces back almost up to the height you dropped it from. And you might not be entirely sure why, but you may realize that this is because, just before impact with the ground and just after impact with the ground, the ball is going about the same speed. The velocity changes, right? It was going down before the impact and up after, but the speed remains almost the same. On the other hand, you could have something like a squash ball, which doesn't bounce back up nearly as high, and that is because its speed just after impact is quite a bit less than its speed just before impact. And then the most extreme case is something like, well, not a ball, but a bean bag, where you drop it and it just goes splat, and its speed after the impact is zero. So depending apparently on perhaps the uh, nature of the interaction between the ball and the ground, the speed can change during the bounce by different amounts. So we've got these two observations, one about different kinds of cart collisions and one about different kinds of ball bounces. Can we come up with a single explanation for both? And we can guess that apparently it's not something to do with momentum. If you're not convinced that the ball bouncing off the ground and the two carts colliding are very similar situations, then here's something that may convince you. Here I have a cart moving along and it's going to collide with the other cart and look, I've attached a camera onto the cart that's currently moving. And so we're going to be able to see what this collision looks like from the viewpoint of one of the two carts. Here's the view from the camera on the moving cart and if you can ignore the background moving by, you may be able to convince yourself that what you're seeing is the other cart moving in and bouncing off of this cart while this cart that we're riding along with is just sitting stationary. So now think of this analogously to how you see the bouncing ball when you're standing beside it and watching it. So you see the one cart come in with a velocity like this, and a moment later after the collision you see it move out with a velocity like this. I can plot up a position versus time graph for the one cart as you see it from the other cart, and it looks like this. And the thing to notice is that we can pull some slopes off, so there's the slope before the bounce, and there's the slope after the bounce, and so these are x components of velocity, and their magnitudes then are the speed. And so notice that the speed, as seen from the other cart, is the same before and after the collision. So this is very much like a very bouncy ball bouncing off the floor. Relative speed is the tool we need. In analogy, a very bouncy ball has the same speed after the bounce as before, but as we've already seen with the carts colliding, we actually see it in our data, a very bouncy collision, like the magnetic interaction between the carts has the same relative speed after the collision as it does before. We're going to call this a collision with the same relative speed before and after an elastic collision. So now we get some useful terminology. The relative speed the same before and after, we call it an elastic collision. If the relative speed is less after the collision than it was before, we call that an 
inelastic collision, right? Non-elastic, inelastic. If the relative speed is zero after, as we've seen, that's what happens when you use the Velcro and the things stick together. We call that a totally inelastic collision. So that's just the most extreme case of an inelastic collision. And there is one more possibility if the relative speed is greater after the collision than it is before. Now, you, you might be wondering how that's even possible, but the name of it will give you a pretty good clue of how it's possible because we call this an explosive separation. You might be a little puzzled right now because you've probably come across elastic collisions in a previous course, and the definition you learned probably didn't have anything to do with relative speed. Well, don't worry, we're getting to the definition that you know very soon. Because relative speed is convenient. It's really nice, you can easily measure it directly, and it actually turns out to be very convenient for computing things. But there's something it isn't. It isn't extensive. Think about doubling the system size of a pair of colliding carts. Well, when you double the system size, you have to keep everything the same except the system size, and so in particular, you keep their velocities the same. Well, that means the relative speed hasn't changed when you double the system size. And so, relative speed isn't extensive. And we like extensive quantities. They're convenient. They've got all those nice properties, that nice accounting system. And besides, you know that every time I talk about extensive quantities, you're going to get to look at cute cat pictures. And who doesn't want to do that? So we would like an extensive quantity that somehow tells us whether relative speed remains unchanged. To get an extensive quantity, we want something that we can write as if the whole system has the quantity q and the system consists of two parts, then those parts are going to be q1 and q2, and you just add them to get the total. That's how extensive quantities work. Well, we're going to show later that this thing called kinetic energy has all the properties we want. I'm not going to prove that yet, we're just going to go and use it for a while, and I'll prove it later. So here is the kinetic energy. And the point here is that this is the kinetic energy of an object. This K represents the kinetic object, the kinetic energy of one object. And so, when we're finding the kinetic energy of our system, we just add the kinetic energies of all the objects. And in particular, because this kinetic energy is proportional to inertia, that's the inertia of the object we're finding the kinetic energy of, we know, since inertia is extensive, that kinetic energy will also be extensive. And this V here is the speed, not the velocity, notice, the speed of the object. And so this K, the kinetic energy, is extensive, and we'll show much later that it stays the same whenever the relative speed stays the same. So I'm not going to prove yet that kinetic energy does what I just said it does, but I will show you an example of it doing it. So here's data from the momentum unit for a double cart colliding with a single cart. This is a magnetic interaction, so we expect this is probably elastic. Let's see, and this is real data, so it probably won't work out exactly. It probably isn't perfectly elastic, but let's see what the numbers tell us. So let's get this relative speed. So this is the relative speed of A relative to B, and so it's going to be... And that's easy because this one is zero, and the other one is 0.68, so that just comes out to 0.68 meters per second. So if it's elastic, we expect the relative speed after to come out to the same thing. So we do all the same stuff, but with the final. And so with the absolute values, that does indeed come out to 0.68 meters per second, exactly as it was at the start. So the relative speeds are saying this is elastic. So now let's get the kinetic energies and see if they agree. If the kinetic energies come out the same, that means this is elastic. So this will be the kinetic energy of A initially plus the kinetic energy of B initially, right? That's how extensive quantities work. And the initial speed squared of A, but that speed is easy. A is just moving along the x-axis, and so its speed just is its x-component of velocity. 
And if you try that out, you'll find it comes out to about 0.12. And look at the units, that's kilogram meter squared per second squared. And this kilogram meter squared per second squared is joules. That's the definition of joules. And so this is very close. Like I said, this is real data and it's probably not absolutely perfectly elastic, but now we see the relative speeds are unchanged and the kinetic energy hasn't changed.